It's a privilege to be before you once again on this Lord's Day morning. If you would be turning to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, we will find our text in this chapter this morning. A few opening remark, remarks before we do so. If, <coughs> excuse me, if I were to say or even yell, remember the Alamo, what would that call to your minds? If you know anything about Texas history, you'll know that this was used as a rallying cry during the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836. And you'll also be familiar with the events that occurred at the Alamo. But going to the Battle of San Jacinto, this battle lasted 18 minutes. So naturally, this was a great victory for Sam Houston as well as the Texan Army. Now we find a very similar rallying cry in our text this morning of Jeremiah chapter 7. Of that chapter, we'll read the first 15 verses. Jeremiah chapter 7, starting in verse 1, where it says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, are these. For if ye throughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye throughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers, forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not? And come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to all these, or to do all these abominations? Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard it not, and I called you, and ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you, and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Instead of being a cry to inspire troops toward victory, the cry that we've just read about was meant as a warning against Judah. Around 600 B.C., in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, the people of Judah were facing difficult times, to put it very lightly. At this point, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken captive by the Assyrians. And eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would conquer Assyria 
And he is now focusing his sights on Judah. As we have seen from our text, the people of Judah had developed a false trust. We see that this false trust was ultimately condemned by Jehovah God through his prophet Jeremiah. And as such, we as members of the church would do well to remember, learn from, and avoid these things today. Let us first consider the false trust of Judah. We see from verses 1 through 7 that the people of Judah trusted in the physical temple. They put stock in the temple. This was done to excuse their failure to fully serve the Lord. It is during this time that Jeremiah was commissioned to preach in the temple, verses 1 through 2. His message was very simple, to call Judah unto repentance, ultimately pointing to the impending danger and destruction brought on by the forces of Babylon, verse 3. We have seen that their trust was in fact the temple, the physical structure found there in Jerusalem. We saw that basically their attitude was, surely we are safe. The Lord will not allow his temple, his house, to be destroyed. We see, that, we see this concept implied by their threefold statement, the temple of the Lord. Verse 4. The Lord, we know, required more than just rituals involving temple worship and outward piety. Repentance and service, we see, were to be done thoroughly or thoroughly, completely, all to the point that it would be, in fact, acceptable before God. It wasn't just to be lip service or going through the motions. It was supposed to mean something from this people. Not just animal sacrifices, but sacrifices on their behalf. We see these in verse 5. This would even extend to how these individuals would deal with each other on a daily basis. Verses 5 and 6. They were dealing wrongfully with each other. They were not fair as the law commanded. Only a return to this true service would spare Judah from the coming Babylonian captivity as its sister Israel had already been involved in. Verse 7. We see that this false trust was put in the temple also in order to excuse their obvious sins. Verses 8 through 11. Once more, we point out that this was a false trust. Verse 8. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. A lie will never do anybody any good. We usually try to lie to people to spare them the unfortunate truth or the ugly truth. That's not how God sees things. A lie is worthless. It cannot and will never profit anyone anything. They were guilty of blatant transgressions of the law. Verse 9. After all, think of how many commandments, specifically in verse 9, that were violated. But they're doing it as a normal way of life. They would then go to the temple, believing that their action of being at the temple would excuse their abominable conduct, their abominable way of life, their sinful outlook, their sinful behavior. Verse 10. However, the Lord, as is always true, is able to see through their hypocrisy. Verse 11. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. We see this idea carried on through in Jesus' day, where they're trying to sell animals for sacrifice. Later we see our Savior overthrowing tables. For the same purpose, God is angry here. This place was a house of worship. Instead, they turned it into a Walmart. That's wrong for several reasons. Now as a side note, as we continue that thought, 600 years had, changed, or 600 years had passed before 
Jesus came to the earth physically. He walked in the flesh. But we see that the Jews did in fact hold basically the same view. Even after captivity. It's pointed out to them that they had added different levels of severity to their oaths. In order to make one oath more important than others. Matthew chapter 23 verses 16 through 22. Jesus there pronounces this woe. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God. And by him that sitteth thereon. So as we said, not much has changed in this 600 years as far as the outlook of the Jews. And their willingness to violate the law of Moses. To be unacceptable before God. They put stock in the physical temple. John chapter 2 verses 19 and 20. So much so that this was actually a point of contention during the mock trial of our Savior. Matthew chapter 26 verse 61. And later on the cross. Jesus was mocked for this. In Mark chapter 15 verses 29 and 30. And they that passed by railed on him. Wagging their heads and saying. Ah thou that destroyest the temple. And buildest it in three days. Save thyself and come down from the cross. You see, they didn't understand what he was talking about. He was referencing his body. But they had blinders on, if you will. They put more stock in the temple, the physical structure that was intended as God's representation for his dwelling place, that they couldn't see what was actually going on. Throughout all of this, we then see Jehovah's response to the sinful behavior of Judah. To the folly of this false trust, God exclaims, Remember Shiloh. Jeremiah 7 verse 12. But go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh. Key word there was. Where I set my name at the first. And see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. In effect, God is saying, Go learn your history. Remember what was done in Shiloh due to the evil that Israel had committed. You know, you can destroy monuments, you can destroy statues, but that will never change the history that occurred. God is pointing this out. Remember Shiloh. Let us call to mind what exactly happened here. We find in Joshua chapter 18 verse 1 that the tabernacle was built here. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued, or subdued before them. Again, Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. Going forward a little bit in Israel's history to 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. So you see through the evil that these two boys had committed. If you will remember, they perverted the worship to God. They were taking more than was allotted to them by the law of Moses and the animal sacrifices. And they perverted the worship of Israel. And as a result, Israel was punished. The ark was taken. 
by the Philistines. God promised to do likewise both to Jerusalem and the temple. In our text, verses 13 through 15. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, so that we see a sense of urgency. There's always, there's always an urgency behind preaching the truth. Whenever error pokes its head up out of its den, that's when we need to be preaching the truth. Of course, we need to be fighting always, but specifically dealing with that error. Jeremiah rising up early and speaking. But he condemns them, but ye heard it not. And I called you, but he answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and near your fathers, which will be the land itself, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all of your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Again, that referencing the northern tribes of Israel. We see that Judah stood accused for violating God's commandments. They failed to heed the many warnings, as we've seen in verse 13. And because of this, what had happened at Shiloh would now happen to them. There at Jerusalem, verse 14. Judah would then be taken into captivity, just as Ephraim or Israel was in the years prior. Verse 15. All of this would eventually come to pass. Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 12 through 30 is a record of that account. We'll read only five verses of that to illustrate exactly what happened. Verse 12 of that chapter. Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon, into Jerusalem, and burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men, burned he with fire. And then dropping down to verse 28, verse 29 and verse 30. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,000 Jews and three and 20. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. In the 320th year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews 700 Forty and five persons. All the persons were 4,600. So the temple, the physical structure was destroyed. And the inhabitants of Judah were taken captive. We are given a solemn warning about God's dealings with Israel. In 1 Corinthians chapter, 11, or chapter 10 verses 11 and 12. Everything we've talked about this morning... Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, yet lest he fall. History is there for us to learn from. Not to like or dislike, but to do better to learn from. And we thankfully have the history of Israel to learn from. Now, as Christians, we can have a similar false trust. We can trust in the church, that is, the physical members. Could we have, indeed, a false trust as members of the church with which Christ built? We can have a sense of the temple, the temple, just like the Jews did of old. There may be those who today cry instead, the church of Christ Rather than being faithful to God, they put stock in either the physical building or safety in numbers. It's a false concept, but many would have this position. Typically, they would act and even believe that the membership excuses different things, such as negligence or even inactive service. The faulty line of reasoning would be as follows. 
the church of Christ will be saved. I am a member of that church, therefore I will be saved. As long as I am a member, I can get by. I can skip Bible class simply because I need more sleep. I know I need more beauty sleep. But there are more important things than me just getting my rest. I need to learn the Bible more in depth. Now that certainly doesn't take away from personal study. But we have Bible classes for a reason. And that is to educate us more fully. Then I might be able to skip worship because, well, my back hurts because I was sitting in a stadium all weekend. Or I was bent over in the garden pushing myself farther than I should have, not being mindful of that I need to be worshiping God the next day. We typically don't think about those things. We think about our retirement. We want to put money into a 401k. We're more concerned about 20 years down the road than we are two days later when I'm expected as a Christian to worship God on the first day of the week in spirit and truth as he has commanded. There are obligations that are put upon us and we often let them slip. Thus, even if sins of omission are present, my ticket has been punched. So the mentality goes. However, have we forgotten about the parable of the tares found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43? Jesus gives the meaning of it in these verses. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth, sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels. And they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. You see, one may be in the kingdom currently, yet on the last day cast out of the kingdom. Salvation is dependent upon the individual's allegiance to God, not merely by being associated with those that are indeed faithful. We hear a lot about herd immunity. That's the idea here as far as religion goes. The brethren next to me on the pew, they're saved. I know they're good. That way, now I can act as a heathen and still be okay because their piety outweighs my will to do iniquity. But Jesus defeats this idea in John chapter 15 verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. What about sinful action? That is, sins of commission. We see that the Jews disobeyed God, but they still tried to claim exemption. After all, they had the temple. They had the dwelling place, the physical manifestation of God's dwelling place. Therefore, their ticket was punched, right? We've seen that to be false. What if the child of God lives as one of the world six days of the week? yet even re regularly attends worship services. What if one engages in different forms of immorality and worldliness? Can that individual be properly labeled as a faithful member of the Lord's church as a Christian? Certainly not. Do we think that God has changed 
His grace demands holy and godly living. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. However, if we choose to despise this grace, we have nothing to expect but his wrath. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 through 31. What response from God should we expect? As we said, it would be his wrath. But to the folly of hypo hypocritical living, we would receive the same stern condemnation that Jesus gave the scribes and Pharisees of his day. There in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 through 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres which indeed appear beautiful outwards, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. As many of you know, we went, the, the West and Palooka clan went to Arkansas this past year, and we spent some time in, in Hot Springs, and we got to know about some of the gangster life that has been going on there. And you, you're on the street level, and you see everything like a normal city would be, people doing the normal things, businesses being open, traffic. There's always traffic. But then we, we watched a video about a history of the city, and there's a whole underground network that allow these gangsters to move their product, to, do, to be gangsters, and nobody ever knew. You had this fairly pretty city, but underneath was full of lying, stealing, cheating, death, all forms of iniquity. It's kind of what Jesus is pointing out here. Outwardly, we're a whited se or these, these Pharisees and scribes were whited sepulchers. They looked pretty. They were ornate. They were gorgeous structures. However, due to their hypocrisy, they were filled of dead men's bones. They were hypocrites. To such a false trust, a similar rallying cry to remember Shiloh would be found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Instead, that cry would be remember Sardis. Remember Sardis. We won't have time to read that this morning, but Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We see that this congregation was considered to have a living name, yet would not be spared from the threat of condemnation. Verse 1 through 3. And as pointed out, salvation is based upon the individual conse or consecration and not merely that of the entire group. Verses 4 through 6. Another rallying cry would be that of remember Laodicea. Still Revelation chapter 3, but instead verses 14 through 22. Again, we won't have time to read that this morning. So I would encourage you to read both of those passages. But speaking of Laodicea, we see in verses 14 and 15 that the brethren there had become lukewarm. They were in danger of expulsion because of their worldliness. Verses 16 and 17. Thus they were in need of the rebuke and chastening that they received from our Lord. Verses 18 through 22. As we try to wrap things up, we must remember that the Jews in the day of Jeremiah had salvation from impending destruction extended to them. It was contingent, however, on their wholehearted service to God. But even through all the warnings, they failed to render this, this faithful service to Jehovah. We have been given the same warnings today. Not only from the, the, the ability and privilege we have of learning from the Old Testament to see how Jehovah dealt with sinful activity, but that of the, of the New Testament. Our salvation depends on complete and faithful obedience to the will of Christ. That is an individual thing. Collectively, we must be faithful, 
but it must start with the individual. Otherwise, we have nothing else to expect than what happened to Israel and Judah of old. Consider Romans chapter 11, verses 19 through 22. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he spare also, or also spare thee, spare not thee. Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. This must continually be on our minds as, as members of the church. To indeed take advantage of God's goodness. But that with it comes the responsibility of being faithful to him. And executing our obligations as he has laid out in his scriptures. Particularly the New Testament. There is but one way to escape this severity as we've just read. And that is to accept God's goodness. That is to, from the heart, obey the gospel of Christ, believing in Christ as the Son of God, repenting of your past sins, and ultimately being baptized for the remission of those sins, contacting the very blood of our Savior. At that point, we become recipients of God's goodness. Only then are you a Christian, a child of God, thus subject to to inherit heaven when this life in the flesh is over, if you remain faithful, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Or, as a child of God that has allowed sin back in your life, you have allowed the ways of the world to deceive you, why not be restored this morning and again receiving God's goodness? Whichever of these might apply to you, please make this need known as together we stand and sing.